Hello, Edyard Denny here. It's uh, May 30th, uh, Memorial Day uh, weekend. I hope uh, you had a uh, very good Memorial Day weekend. We had uh, remarkably nice weather on um, Sunday and Monday. I remember a uh, long history of Memorial Days where uh, it's been rainy and cold. It wasn't a good start to the summer, but uh, maybe uh, th this time it'll be different and uh, we'll have, uh, we can look forward to a good summer, all of us. I hope so. <clears throat> it's been a rough year this so far this year in the stock market and then the bond market. Uh, and um, I'm not making any promises that it's going to be any easier over the rest of the year. Let me uh, turn off my uh, cell phone here. It's making noises in the background. <clears throat> there we go. Um, but um, as we uh, look ahead here, uh, there's uh, lots to, uh, to think about uh, for, for sure. Um, I uh, so I'm pre-recording this um, session of our weekly webcast uh, simply because my wife and I are going uh, tomorrow, May 31st, Monday. We're going to fly out to uh, Yellowstone National Park. We're going to visit there for a few days, and then the uh, Grand Tetons. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, so I'm wearing a brown shirt. I'm thinking about maybe. Uh, taking a clean version of the shirt, um, just kind of blend in with the scenery. I'm a little nervous about getting uh, chased by bears, uh, but I'm told that uh, as long as uh, you don't have any food in your car or carry any food with you and, and don't uh, threaten uh, the cubs of the mama bears, everything will be just, just fine. So anyways, we're looking forward to communing with nature and uh, probably tens of thousands of other uh, uh, tourists that uh, will, will be out in the national parks. Well, uh, this uh, week, uh, we started the, we're starting the week focusing on valuation. We've been uh, discussing valuation all this year. It's been a, a major issue. Let's have a, a look at some of the charts that are relevant to, to valuation. Uh, in my 2008 uh, book, uh, 2018 book, I should say, uh, my professional autobiography, uh, one of the chapters is about valuation, and I said of all the variables that I have to forecast, uh, valuation's got to be one of the tougher ones. I've often said that forecasting the market's actually pretty easy uh, compared to uh, forecasting the economy. Uh, when you forecast the S&P 500, you just got to forecast uh, PE, the valuation multiples, and uh, E, earnings. Um, and that's easy to do. <laughs> Getting those two variables right is, the, is, is tricky. And it's particularly tricky this year because um, uh, earnings of the two variables, uh, I think, is the easier one for an, uh, somebody trained as an economist like myself. Uh, but of course, there's the big issue of whether we're going to have a recession or not. And the EI uses uh, forward earnings, which is analyst consensus expectations for earnings. And the problem with the analysts is they never anticipate a recession. So they're not going to give us a clue here if a recession is going to suddenly hit when and if it does, uh, they're going to run for the hills like everybody else and to scramble to cut their estimates. Uh, so they're not going to give us any uh, uh, le leading uh, indication of uh, where this economy is going. So we have to make up our own minds. <laughs> I think the economy is going to continue to grow, but I'm becoming a little bit more nervous about that. Uh, recently, just last week, we uh, raised our uh, odds of a recession from 30% to 40%. Um, what I was unnerved about was the regional business surveys that uh, five Federal Reserve banks put out, and uh, they were uh, four of the five that are out uh, were very weak uh, in um, in May, uh, and I am kind of nervous about this administration's uh, policy towards energy. Uh, just last week, uh, President Biden uh, was in Tokyo, and he uh, almost gloated about the fact that uh, the price of gasoline is so high. So, well, this is kind of a transition from uh, the fossil fuel era to a renewable uh, energy era. And uh, he seems to have this view, the administration has this view, and as do climate activists, that uh, the best way to make the transition is uh, to go cold turkey, uh, to uh, have the government to do things that uh, reduce the supply relative to the demand, push up the price of fossil fuels, and force people to... Uh, make a decision to buy electric vehicles and to use uh, more electricity and, and so on. And um, that's, uh, that's a, well, it's, it's kind of a crazy thing to do. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's 
too much too fast. It's not really well thought out. And clearly economists and uh, tech, technical uh, te te technologists aren't really thinking about uh, all this. The energy people aren't thinking about all this. Uh, this is just kind of being forced on us uh, without a great deal of thought, without a great deal of analysis of the cost benefit uh, of, of the transition and how you do it smoothly uh, without uh, causing more trauma and more uh, damage than um, ultimately is uh, the reward for all this. So I am concerned about uh, that. And uh, we know that uh, the past six uh, recessions in the US prior to the pandemic were associated with rising energy prices. That doesn't mean the rising energy prices caused the recessions, but uh, like I said, there is a coincidence with uh, energy prices going up and recessions. So that's something to uh, be concerned about. Uh, but for now, I am not, uh, that's not my most likely case. 60% uh, that the economy continues to grow in a slow fashion. Um, and even in the recession, I'm using the word mild to describe a recession, not something severe. Because again, I don't see a credit crunch. I don't see the kind of the, the typical recession scenario. But uh, the market uh, clearly uh, has been nervous about a recession. It's been nervous about a more hawkish Fed. It's been nervous that valuation multiples got too high relative uh, to a, um, a, an environment where the Fed is raising interest rates and there's going to be quantitative tightening. And so the market had a, uh, what is still technically speaking, a correction of 18.7% over 136 days. So it's uh, one of the longer corrections, as you can see. Uh, but we've had uh, previous scares like this. Uh, back in 2018, it was down 19.8%. Uh, back here, it was down 19.4%. Um, and uh, last week, uh, we had a nice uh, bounce, uh, partly related to uh, Macy's announcement that uh, their earnings were better than expected, uh, especially after the week before Target disappointed. And so the view of the consumer has become more nuanced, the rec recognition that um, there's strengths and weaknesses in the consumer sector. And the data so far uh, suggests that consumers are con continuing to spend and they're spending even without purchasing power. Um, their real purchasing power has been uh, very weak because inflation's outpacing uh, their wage increases, uh, but uh, they've accumulated a lot of excess savings over the past two years. And we are seeing them uh, lower their savings rate. Uh, so the stock market has had a, a nice bounce here. Uh, by the way, uh, leading the way, of course, were some of the losers, and among the losers uh, were technology companies. And I, I would point out to you, uh, if you can see, this is not the prettiest cover I've ever seen on Business Week. Um, kind of a lot of uh, a lot of things going on here, but the title is the Great Tech Route. So uh, hopefully, uh, this uh, works as a contrary indicator. Certainly worked as a contrary indicator this past week because technology and consumer discretionary were among the uh, two best performers in the uh, S&P 500, as was energy, continuing to be an outperformer, um, and, uh, and financials. Uh, when we look at um, the uh, breadth of the market, uh, I'm kind of working my way up to talking about valuation again, which uh, again, in some ways is a repeat, but it's, in some ways it's really an update of what I've been talking about for quite some time. Um, and here you can see this is the equal weighted versus the market cap weighted. And we know that uh, since the beginning of the year during this correction, that the market uh, cap weighted uh, index has been down more than the equal weighted index. And again, that's because uh, some of the larger cap uh, stocks are the ones that got most overvalued, had the higher, highest valuation multiples, and have had the biggest come up in, in, the, in, in these valuation multiples coming down. So here we go, uh, S&P 500 forward PE. Kind of interesting, we uh, topped out at 19, which is the high for the forward PE uh, for the bull market uh, since uh, 2009. So we got uh, here uh, right before the pandemic pandemic hit, we dropped down to uh, a little below 13. We didn't drop down uh, to re recession lows because the Fed came in with all that uh, liquidity with uh, QE forever. And so the forward PE just shuts right straight up, got up to about uh, 23. Uh, leading the way in there was the uh, companies were deemed to be most benefited by the pandemic. And a lot of them were the technology related companies and a lot of them were the so-called mega cap eight uh, companies, the largest uh, eight capitalized uh, stocks in the growth uh, uh, sector of the S&P 500. 
And uh, we seem to hold our own here in, in 2020, 21. Um, the pandemic was ongoing. There were uh, waves of the pandemic. And so these companies uh, continue to benefit from people working from home, uh, getting entertained at home, getting educated at home. Uh, but uh, as the pandemic uh, sort of wore on and the perception was that uh, we're either going to completely get out of it or just learn to live with it, which is really kind of what's happened, uh, we started to see some erosion in the uh, overall PE, uh, led by an erosion in the mega cap eight. Uh, and then we started out the year at around uh, 21 uh, for the uh, S&P 500 forward PE. And ever since it's taken uh, almost a straight line drop, uh, got down to about 16 and a half. We thought 16 would hold, uh, got down to 16 and a half, bounced off of that. Um, just seems to us that 16 or 16 and a half uh, is a reasonably fair value in the event uh, that we're uh, right uh, about the economy continuing to grow without a recession. Uh, it implies that uh, the forward PEs of the market, uh, excluding the uh, big cap, uh, highly valued names, is even lower, something like 15. And that seems like a reasonable uh, PE level. So um, I think we're, we're kind of where we should be on an evaluation basis. But uh, I don't think we're going back to, uh, to, to uh, 19. I guess we could test it. But uh, we're already, by the way, on Friday, back to 17 and a half. So this is uh, a pretty volatile market and can move quite a bit. Um, uh, of course, uh, the bond yield has a lot to do with uh, the valuation. Um, the bond yield shot up to 3.2% uh, in, uh, in May, and uh, that uh, contributed to the drop in the, in the forward PE. And here you can see the forward PE in the blue, and the red is the inverse of the bond yield. But the bond yield has uh, uh, come down somewhat uh, in recent uh, days, past couple of weeks, uh, partly because the stock market's been taking a dive. So... Uh, safe haven uh, seems to be the, the bond market. And uh, maybe there's just a perception that um, inflation is uh, peaking, uh, will come down and bonds yielding 3% are a, uh, a good buy. Now, having said all that, uh, and again, I'm delighted that the market had a good week last week. Uh, it's not like uh, you know everything is, uh, is okay now. I mean, uh, just because the market sold off and made uh, its low for the year on target, uh, over a week ago, and uh, then regained everything on the Macy's news. Um, and I guess they, you know, the FOMC minutes came out and they weren't more, even more hawkish. You know, we've seen an, ex an, an increasing hawkishness from the Fed and it looks like the Fed's finally at peace. It's, uh, it's, it's come, come to terms where, where it wants to go. And so its hawkishness is 50 basis points in May, 50 basis points in July. And then they're going to stop for a while. So the market's already looking ahead to when they're going to stop, but they haven't said anything at all about uh, reconsidering their quantitative tightening uh, mode. And uh, that's because they haven't even started that. And uh, you might be interested in this chart, uh, figure five, where we have um, shown you kind of where the quantitative tightening is going to take the Fed's uh, holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And it, uh, it's not a pretty picture for uh, liquidity and for the and for the outlook for either bonds or stocks. But notice back here, the Fed was also projecting that it was gonna go back to normalize the, the balance sheet uh, during QT1 and uh, things happened, uh, things changed. And so they wound up uh, forgetting about that and suddenly they're accumulating assets again. This time around, who knows what will happen uh, looking up, up ahead here. I guess I'm supposed to know, but uh, I'll admit uh, I, uh, I, I have lots of uh, suppositions of how the future will play out. Uh, but like everybody else, uh, I've, you know, I, I am data dependent. We'll see how things play out. I kind of doubt that this is the way it'll play out. That'll be kind of a, a miracle. Uh, but it is something to be concerned about because we haven't even really started doing it. And nobody's really quite sure what QT2 implies for the bond yield. Will it stay around 3%? Uh, or will um, the Fed's uh, letting the, its balance sheet uh, decline by 95 billion per month uh, start to have an upward uh, pressure on the bond market? We'll, we'll see. Uh, pay no attention to the barking dog. My, my mother-in-law's uh, here, and uh, so she's got a dog. So we got four dogs in the house. Uh, she's got to watch the dogs while we go watch the bears in Yellowstone. Uh, here's the forward PEs. Uh, and you can see this is the mega cap eight 
that I've shown you many, many times, and uh, they've had quite a comeuppance. Uh, this was the melt up, this is the meltdown, uh, and they're actually below where they were before the pandemic. And so they have had uh, really quite a considerable correction uh, and, and certainly are more fairly valued than they were back here with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, you can take a look at this chart yourself. We've looked at it before and uh, you can see that the uh, PE for the uh, S&P 500, 17 and a half uh, up from 16 and a half uh, from, from its recent low. So it's, it's bounced up quite a bit. Uh, maybe too much in, in too short a period of time, but the mega cap eight are still uh, significant um, in the S&P 500. They account for um, a fifth, uh, 21, 22% uh, of the S&P 500 market cap. Uh, and uh, that's uh, th this number. And then 46% uh, of, of, of growth. So they, they, they still matter a lot. And here uh, we've had some questions uh, on a regular basis uh, and on regularly we update this chart showing the S&P 500 uh, mega cap 8 PE uh, down to 24.6, down to where it was uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, get kind of close to where it was at the bottom of the uh, lockdowns. Um, and you can see that uh, Joe did this chart uh, just to show that uh, during 2018-19, the mega cap eights uh, accounted for about a, a percentage point of the um, uh, S&P 500's uh, market uh, PE. Uh, and uh, that jumped up with the uh, pandemic to a contribution of two, two and a half percentage points to the PE of the S&P 500. And now we're down to 1.4. So uh, again, their, their impact is diminishing, but it's certainly had a big impact on the sell-off we've had so far this year. Meanwhile, what can I tell you? The analysts uh, are on a different planet. Uh, they don't see a recession coming. Uh, we're kind of straddling their planet and the investors' planets because we're looking at the PEs, which is what investors uh, determine is what they're willing to pay for the uh, uh, forward earnings estimates of the analysts. And clearly the investors are saying that uh, they don't have as much confidence in the uh, investors' outlook. And maybe they're getting even less confidence as, as the uh, analysts just continue to uh, remain bullish. L look at revenues per share. Uh, the weekly forward, it's all-time record high. Forward earnings, all-time record high. And both of them are great indicators of the actual numbers. And uh, they will be right as long as there's no recession. Recession is the risk. Uh, meanwhile, operating profit margins, I keep getting beat on by some uh, uh, of, of, of our accounts saying that I'm too optimistic on operating profit margins. I think companies are doing a great job and intend to continue to do a great job to maintain their profit margins. I was a little bit uh, disheartened by Target, but on the other hand, uh, the Macy's numbers looked uh, better. Uh, but all in all, I think the operating profit margins are hanging in there pretty well. And that's what uh, this data suggests. Uh, the forward profit margin remains at an all-time record high. Again, all of that can change if we're a recession. If we have a recession, the PE's got lower to go because E's going to take a dive. The profit margin will take a dive. Everything bad that can happen happens uh, in uh, recessions when it comes to the stock market. Uh, so figure 10, meanwhile, shows that uh, uh, the uh, analysts are just whistling along, having a great time here. And uh, even with the first quarter, well, the, by the way, the first quarter's uh, earnings season was pretty good. Uh, going into the season, the expectations with, was that earnings would be up 5% on a year-over-year -year basis. It's come out to be uh, up 10%. Uh, so yeah, there have been some disappointments along the way, but... Uh, on balance, uh, once again, it was a positive earnings hook to the upside. And uh, while some guidance was negative, plenty of guidance was positive. And you can see that analyst consensus expectations for this year, next year, uh, continue to move on to record highs. And when we take the time-weighted average of these two, we get forward uh, earnings, which is what we use when we do PE times E. And you can see that that's up uh, to, uh, let's see, we're forward earnings on May 19th. 237.56, all-time record high. Uh, the growth rate looks uh, looks great, uh, at least the analyst consensus expectations. Now, again, when we do PE times Z, uh, we're doing using forward earnings and uh, forward PEs. And uh, you know, on a regular basis, uh, Joe and I give you our uh, estimates for what earnings are going to be this year and next year. I pay no attention to those numbers. What what really matters 
is what you think, what I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't really matter what we think the annual numbers are. We should use the annual numbers that we're thinking about to guide us in what we think forward earnings uh, will be. Forward earnings or what analysts will anticipate earnings will be uh, next year. Um, and so as you can see here, right now over the next 52 weeks, uh, they're expecting 23, uh, $237. Uh, what matters uh, for forecasting where the market will be at the end of the year and the end of next year is to look at uh, where uh, we think that uh, forward earnings will be at the end of this year. And we're using 255 and 275. So that's kind of our the end points of these blue and green uh, lines shows you where we think forward earnings are going. So these are the numbers that you want to uh, multiply by uh, forward PEs uh, to get at the estimates of where, you, where we think the market's going to go, where you think the market's going to go. So you've got to come agree with these, conclude that they're, you know, if you think where the recession is coming, these are way too high, they're going to be down, and it's a whole different uh, scenario. If you agree with us, there's no recession, then these are actually fairly reasonable conservative estimates. Uh, the problem is that if you apply reasonable uh, PEs of 15 to 17, uh, the market remains below its uh, record high at the beginning of the year, uh, throughout the year. So, uh, but by next year, there's a, uh, certainly a potential for the market to be back up at record high territories. Read all about it in the morning briefing that's associated with uh, these charts. Uh, so again, um, forward earnings is going to be highly correlated with the uh, business cycle. Um, uh, our view is they continue to, to grow. And here you can see the year over year forward earnings versus the ISM manufacturing survey. Yeah, we'll get an update on that for May in um, uh, uh, tomorrow, well, well, I should say on uh, Wednesday. And uh, there's some indications in the regional survey that this could be down a lot. Uh, and this uh, correlation with forward earnings is something to be concerned about uh, when it comes to predicting PE times E. So we're watching that. Uh, you can see here's the uh, regional manufacturing index for the four um, uh, Fed banks. And you can see it took a, a dive here uh, today, uh, today, I should say Tuesday. I'm a little bit off because I'm talking here on Monday, May 30th and Tuesday is when we're gonna get the Dallas Fed uh, survey. So that'll update, but it's not gonna change the look of this thing. It's pretty close to zero and it's got a pretty high correlation as you can see with the ISM. So if the ISM uh, in turn goes to something, just takes a dive here down to 50, that's gonna suggest that uh, forward earnings are gonna grow at a slower pace. And that could obviously ch change my view on what the upside potential is for the, mar for the market. Um, uh, now look at this, this is the MP, uh, uh, manufacturing PMI versus the S&P 500. Just to cut to the chase, just to get to what we're interested in here. What's the stock market uh, all about? And how does it relate to this macroeconomic fundamentals? And you can see that um, the MPMI, uh, again, uh, if the regional stuff is right, it could take a dive down to, down to here. Uh, if that's the case, and that will be consistent with the market being unchanged on a year over year basis, which then would imply the market would be around 4,200, which is, guess what? It's about where it is. Um, if on the other hand, this fundamental holds up and the, um, uh, the, the, the market the flash uh, composite uh, for the MPMI suggests that it might hold up better than the regional data suggests, and then that would give you a somewhat more bullish near-term outlook uh, for it. But the, the cycles are pretty clear and right now, we're definitely in the down cycle, at least in terms of growth rate, or in terms, terms of year over year percent changes for the uh, S&P 500. Uh, the good news is uh, th this is very cyclical. And so if we drop, the faster we drop uh, now for the uh, macroeconomic variables like the ISM PMI, uh, the, the sooner we'll see this thing start to move back up again, uh, painting a, a, a brighter picture for the market. Uh, here's the regional, stuff versus the market. And again, the regional stuff correlates reasonably well and the regional is close to zero and uh, it's on the same uh, scale here, as you can see. Um, and that would imply that the market should basically be flat from a year ago, which is exactly 
where it is right now. Uh, let me uh, shorten this up a little bit. I made this a little too long, but then again, we don't have the Q&A uh, session. Uh, but um, on the consumer side, there's something to worry about in the recession and in the sense that uh, uh, the, the real incomes, uh, the real personal income has been declining uh, for the consumer. On the other hand, uh, taking out uh, the, all the volatility caused by government benefits, it's uh, more kind of flattish. Uh, but that's not a, a real exciting scenario for the consumer. The good news is consumers accumulated a tremendous amount of saving uh, over the past uh, two years. So there's probably excess saving and uh, it could be something like a trillion dollars. Uh, look at this. This is what uh, the 24 month sum uh, had been running at. And they were kind of every two years they were accumulating about a trillion. And over the past two years, they've accumulated uh, over two trillion. So that would suggest that the excess savings have accumulated is about a trillion, which uh, gives them some firepower to offset the, the weakness in uh, the real purchasing uh, power when you look at uh, personal income. Uh, but that allows them to save less. Personal saving goes down as they uh, dip into their excess uh, saving. Uh, so that's not really a recession scenario. Uh, but it's not, not a long-term sustainable uh, situation. Uh, so uh, the good news is uh, con consumer spending is still propping up the economy. First quarter real GDP was down 1.5%, but uh, the consumption component was actually around 3%. The uh, Atlanta Fed survey is running around 4%, believe it or not, for the second quarter. So that's still looking uh, pretty good. Um, on inflation, um, uh, we were satisfied uh, with the consumption uh, deflator news that came out uh, last week, at the end of last week. Uh, we are seeing that the consumption deflator is moderating. The growth, the year-over-year -year core is 4.9%. Uh, the three-month uh, um, three percent change uh, is, uh, is, is, is also uh, uh, coming down, as, as you can see. There's something wrong here. I've got a Go back to the drawing board on this one, but we'll 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 take care of it. Uh, but as you can see, the the big story here is that durable goods inflation uh, has come down uh, from its peak, and uh, the outlook is that it's going to continue uh, to uh, to come down. This thing's kind of bothering me a little bit. I know what it is. Uh, <laughs> it should be the same scale. Okay, uh, we'll we'll fix that. Because uh, if you use the same scale, what you see is that it's it's peaked on a year over year basis and that the three month is actually below that. Okay, we're doing this together. Um, Non-durable goods inflation, on the other hand, is kind of stable and the three month is above it. So that's not encouraging. And the services excluding energy, same story, rent inflation is a, a big, big issue there. And there it is, there it is. There's rent, uh, tenant rent, and there's owner occupied, uh, owner's equivalent rent. And you can see that uh, this is gonna probably continue to be a considerable problem uh, in the next, uh, 12 to 18 months offsetting whatever improvement we get in durable goods inflation. Uh, food, again, uh, tough number to call, uh, but it uh, doesn't look like the Biden administration's uh, policies on energy is gonna be helpful uh, either for energy or food. Food obviously uh, can be very much impacted by the cost of energy. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to produce food and uh, that doesn't uh, look very good at this point. So what do we have here? We got stagflation. We got the economy grown probably around two uh, percent. We've got um, the uh, inflation rate uh, peaking but uh, remaining high. We got the bond yield uh, apparently stabilizing just below three percent. Uh, stock market uh, maybe we've you know everybody's been looking for capitulation. Maybe this is just exhaustion. Uh, there's been a lot of selling and the sellers are just exhausted. Uh, and uh, there's obviously been some good. Uh, buying opportunities created here, but uh, it's not like we have no issues left to worry about. The Fed still is just really starting its uh, tightening cycle. Uh, inflation uh, is going to uh, remain uh, troublesome, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, moderating. Um, so uh, we'll be watching this along with you. Uh, but my, my bottom line is uh, this year continues to be volatile and tricky. Um, but uh, looking into next year, I think the fundamentals are going to drive the stock market to, uh, to new highs. And I don't think we're going to have to do that by going back to 19, 20, 21 plus uh, uh, forward PEs. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Have a good week and uh, uh, 
I'm, uh, I'll have my laptop with me, so I'm sure I'll be uh, communicating. As uh, as you know, we've started putting out uh, in recent weeks uh, these quick takes and uh, find it a very good way to communicate with you on a short-term basis, uh, focusing on some of the issues that we think are most important. Again, all the best in the uh, coming week.